Toto Wolf has no limits. He's a workaholic whose team is about to win a record seventh consecutive Constructors' Championship. Yet his desire for more trophies remains all-consuming. That's why he's staying with Mercedes beyond this year, and that's why he's across everything all the time. The man's a machine. Welcome to Beyond the Grid with me, Tom Clarkson, and this week we welcome Toto onto the show for a second time on the eve of what are going to be some eye-watering milestones for both Mercedes and its lead driver Lewis Hamilton in the coming races. And Toto's been in the news quite a bit recently as well. First, when he got caught in the crossfire over the Racing Point pink Mercedes design row. And then when speculation swirled around about his future, would he stay at Mercedes or would he go? And if he left, would Hamilton leave as well? Of course, we now have answers to many of these questions. The Racing Point saga has been sorted out and Toto's going to stay at Mercedes. All the while, of course, his team has continued to dominate the sport like none before it. Mercedes have won all but two of the 11 races in 2020 so far, meaning they've been able to switch resources to next year's car early. And they'll do the same again for the 2022 car. They make it sound so easy, don't they? We discussed all this and more when, two days after the Eiffel Grand Prix, Toto invited me into his home for a catch-up. As we sat down in his study, I noticed the gleaming Formula One World Constructors' Championship trophy sitting behind his desk. Toto and Mercedes won that trophy for the sixth time at Suzuka last year. Bottas the winner of the Japanese Grand Prix. Yes, Valtteri, you're the man. Well done. Woohoo! Valtteri, this is Toto. Congratulations. We just won our sixth Constructor World Championship. Thanks to you guys. Thank you, thank you. And congratulations yes. for today. Congrats to everyone. The Constructors Trophy is something that I'm proud of. And there is one essential thing on the Constructors Trophy is that I always look at the empty bit for the current championship. I don't look at the Mercedes stars or previous champions. I only look at the empty space in 2020. That's your motivation every morning as you come to your desk. No, my motivation, <laughs> these are the motivations that I have in the morning, not to construct this trophy that is hidden in my office. Uh, I see, now what do we call it? The bull and the bear as well, that's on your desk. For those who don't know, what does that mean? The bull and the bear are the representation of the stock market, bull market, bear market. And uh, this was my past and this is actually what I'm doing also. So you're still a city boy at heart? Yes, I'm a racing boy and a city boy. We're in Oxford, right in the heart of Motorsport Valley, aren't we? And given that you could have chosen anywhere to live, how important is it for you to be right here in the heart of it all? I think when you're running a team, there is no other way by being close to the factory and being close to the people. And um, when I decided to jump in full-time at Williams in 2012, I moved to Oxford and obviously my wife likes it. Um, so it has been the place where we spend most of the time. I mean, I heard once that, did you have lots of team principals to dinner? I had it once around the Grand Prix and um, hosted the dinner, I think it was Friday or Saturday night. And then they all started fighting with each other. So it was pretty unpleasant. So I didn't, didn't invite any afterwards anymore. Or when I did, then only one or two of them. Really? Just what, slanging match in the, big, <laughs> in the middle of dinner? Or? They, were sl they were slagging each other off uh, <laughs> like children in the kindergarten. Now, how much time do you actually spend here at home? In a normal Formula One year, and of course this is not a normal year, I'm spending more than 200 days and uh, 200 nights in hotel rooms. So I would be coming back to Oxford to see the family and then spend some time with my elder children in, in Vienna, but less so as they grow up there. My son's out of school in the military service and my daughter is 16, so they haven't got great desire to see their father. So I would say lots of time. Given that you're spending so much time away, is missing home one of the reasons why you've thought so heavily about your future? I thought heavily about my future because the question I ask myself, do I want to be a team manager forever? Single trick pony. But then I actually reminded myself that I have 
also interest in finance and I was still doing it, but I became so focused in my daily job running the team that everything else was pushed aside. And I came to the conclusion that what I do is my passion. I really like to work with all the people in the team. I enjoy going to the racing because I love the stopwatch and the honesty about it. And at the same time, we are at the crossroads in the sport where teams turn from negative results into profitability. So this is actually a good space to be. And this is a place where I can combine again my interest for finance and motor racing. As a team boss, what have you got to achieve? You've, you've ticked all those boxes, haven't you? Yeah, of course. You can say, you know, I'm leaving on a high. Won six championships. We've broken some records. And uh, off I go. And if I were to do this, you would never see me in the paddock again. But then I thought about all the people in the company that I wouldn't want to let down. I thought about the opportunities that lie ahead of us. Not only the sporting opportunities, but we have just created an applied science division within the team that is going strong. I see a bright future for the team and Formula One content, sports content in general, are something that is absolutely the flavor of the months. People are desperate to buy into sports content, into sports franchises. And here I am, I am lucky to own a chunk of a team and that is doing well. So why would I want to leave this space if I enjoy what we actually do, motor racing, and I'm interested in developing the value of the team and helping to develop the value of Formula One. Would you ever consider having 100% your own Grand Prix team, Wolf Grand Prix? No, first of all, it's not a great omen. I think uh, you don't want to call it Wolf. Um, there is no product Wolf that I could endorse like some other companies. And um, I think with the partner, Mercedes-Benz, I am really staggered every time I think about it. There's not many people out there that can say they're a partner with Mercedes-Benz. I'm doing this since a few years now. My relationship to the Daimler management is intact, um, a modern intact. So I don't see any sense in running a Toto team because the power of the brand Mercedes is so strong. I feel honored to represent them. And in your negotiations with them, are you seeking more responsibility perhaps on the road car side as well as Formula One? We discussed whether I should transition into the road car side, but that's not for me. I'm not a big corporation guy. I've always had my own companies and I think this Ola Kalenius and the other board members very much value this as a competitive advantage within the Daimler multinational company that the team is run very in a very entrepreneurial way. So no, there's no desire in going on the automotive side. I enjoy running a sports team. Before we continue with Toto, I need your full attention because there's a new Manscaped product alert. Yes, Manscaped have just released the Weed Whacker. What's that I hear you say? Well, Perhaps you've got too much hair in your ears. Give them a trim with the Manscaped Weed Whacker and you might, you just might be able to hear what I'm saying because this product is a game changer. This nose and ear hair trimmer provides proprietary skin safe technology which helps prevent nicks and snags in those delicate places. So no more eye-watering trimming sessions on the horizon for you. It uses a 9,000 RPM motor-powered 360-degree rotary dual-blade system and is the only nose hair trimmer on the market with a powerful and rechargeable lithium-ion battery that lasts up to 90 minutes. Its intelligently contoured design enhances the trimming experience and it's waterproof, which makes for easy operation and cleaning. And better yet, you'll get a replaceable blade every three months. So upgrade your grooming routine today with the Weed Whacker. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code GRID at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use the code GRID. What are you waiting for? Go whack some weeds. Toto often says that all 2,000 people who work for Mercedes are equally important, but one of them was perhaps a little more special than most. Nicky Lauda was Mercedes' non-executive chairman. He was the team's talisman and inspiration. He was Toto's right-hand man and friend. Together they saw Mercedes go from contenders to conquerors. 
The three-time world champion's death in May 2019 at the age of 70 saddened everyone in the sport. And just six days later, Lewis Hamilton won the Monaco Grand Prix for the team Nicky had convinced him to join. Toto doesn't speak to the drivers on the radio very often, but that day he had something to say. Wearing the crash helmet colours of Nicky Lauda, Lewis Hamilton is the winner of the Monaco Grand Prix. Lewis, that was a victory worth Nicky. Well done, unbelievable job, congratulations. How do you still feel Nicky's loss? Nicky was a very important part in the team. His sheer presence gave us support. And uh, the most important is that I lost a friend. Nicky and I grew together over the last few years like one of my best friends. I spent more time with him than with anybody else. We traveled together, we raced together, um, we had uh, every single dinner together in, in, you know, on all the racetracks. And suddenly that's, that's taken away. And uh, that was quite a difficult process for me to firstly digest losing a friend, but then also digesting, getting over the fact that a very human important side for me on my journey in Formula One was suddenly gone. When you reflect on him now and think about Nicky Lauda, what makes you smile? When I think about Nicky, I need to smile all the time because we had so much fun together, so much laughing about racing and about the normal world. I mean, truly lying on the floor with a tummy ache because we were la laughing so much. And so many stories that I can't tell because they are probably not appropriate to come on your podcast. But I also saw a Nicky Lauda that changed throughout the years. When we were thrown into this adventure together, it was very difficult the first six months because none of us would relinquish control. So it came to a crucial point where the Daimler board said, uh, you know, we need to clear this and invited us to a meeting on Stuttgart airport. And um, right in front of the door where the board members sat inside, Nicky reached out his hand and said, you know, we need to stop this. Let's do it together. I think we can be more successful together than alone. And from that moment on, we went from strength to strength and we never had any conflict anymore. He started to appreciate my strengths and accept my weaknesses. And on the other side, he had lots of strengths and also weaknesses and we were just complimentary. One thing that made us laugh a lot, I'm not very good in the morning, but I can go very long in the evening. Nikki is bored after six o'clock in the morning because he doesn't know what to do, but wants to go to bed at eight o'clock in the evening. So Nikki came up with the concept that we're actually working in two shifts. He's doing the morning shift and I'm doing the evening shift. We've just come back from the Nürburgring. Do you think of Nikki when you're at the Nürburgring and you know, my mind goes back to 1976 and his crash at Bergwerk. I think about Nicky every single day in the race team or at home. He's just so present. And in Nürburgring, there is one funny episode that uh, 10 or 11 years ago, I wanted to do a quick lap around the Nürburgring. And Nicky said, this is so stupid. Nobody actually cares how quick you go around the Nürburgring. And it's so dangerous anyway. And then I did it and it wasn't very successful. I mean, I beat the time, but I also crashed the car with a puncture. And he said, I told you, it's just super stupid. And uh, that was what I remembered. But he's in my, in my thoughts every single day. Have you ever been out to Bergwerk and actually stopped and seen the scene of his accident? No, never. Um, it's just one part of Nicky's life that I admire a lot because you can see his resilience. But... Going to the place was never important for me. I just know about one story where he went there when they did a documentary and there was a bus with some tourists that stopped and they couldn't believe that they saw Nicky Lauda. And one of his guys handed Nicky a half a croissant and Nicky picked it up and said, I found my ear, I found my ear. <laughs> and everybody was pretty shocked. But no particular memory on the back. Right? Every time I passed it with the racing car, I thought about him though. That's so Nicky Lauda, that story you just told me. Now, look, on the subject of the Nordschleife, I don't know whether you heard it when we were um, at the Nürburgring, but the organisers want to bring modern Formula One to the Nordschleife. They've got Hermann Tilker involved, who says it's going to cost something like 100 million euros to get the track up to speed. And then they're thinking about 
having, I think, the race there once every four years in an Olympic year. What are your thoughts on the Nordschleife and modern Formula One? I love the Nordschleife and I love the Nürburgring and I love the Eiffel. Actually, I'm not allowed to say that. My wife says, you like the Nordschleife and you love me, but I love it anyway. So no chance. I think it is much too dangerous like it is today. It has no runoff areas. It has so much bumps and jumps that a Formula One car would never drive there safely at speed. And if you would touch the Nordschleife to make it Formula One compatible, you would destroy the whole DNA of the track. Let's just leave it like it is. It's a thing from the past. GT cars race there and already that is pretty dangerous. I think we should go out there and enjoy a lap with a normal car or with a sports car. But please, let's not destroy the last iconic racetrack. And you think you would have to destroy it to get it ready for Formula One, modern Formula One? Absolutely. You would need to uh, repave the whole thing. You would need to take the crests and compressions away because a modern Formula One car cannot go over a bump with 350Ks. It would just fly away. There is 200 odd corners. You would need to create runoff areas because it's so fast. It's just completely I unrealistic. I thought, Toto, you'd be like, you'd be all over that. I thought that's interesting. I thought, no, if you, if you make it a Formula One car with runoff areas, you destroy the whole thing. Yeah. That is the appeal of the notch life. That is dangerous. And it's a, that, it, that is a relict of the past. A relic. That's interesting. This from a man who almost died at the Nürburgring 10 years ago. Yeah. And this is what makes the appeal of the Nürburgring. You need to pre if you want to go fast there, you need to be on the case. And everybody who races there at serious speeds will come back and tell you that you're not angst free there. And everybody who's participated in the 24 hour race will tell you that it's freaking scary in the night, in the rain, in the fog, with a pedal pushed down to the floor. And this is what makes the race. Sochi, where he won his first Grand Prix. It's win number nine in Formula One for Valtteri Bottas. Get in there! Yes! <laughs> yeah! I think, again, it's a nice moment to thank my critics to go with my concern. You. Do you think Valtteri's got the hardest job of any driver in the pit lane? Absolutely, yes. Valtteri has tremendous talent and a great work ethic. He's somebody very intelligent, confident and resilient, but also skeptical about his own performances. And this is the ingredient actually to be very successful. But he happens to go against a six-time world champion, somebody that's just won 91 races. And he knows that, but it actually pushes him. And if you look at, at his performances, he could have been on pole at least three times this year and just missed out with a tiny margin. He could or should have won maybe two or three more races this year if safety cars or races being stopped wouldn't have worked against him. And he knows that and we know that. Do you feel he is more competitive this year than he was in any previous season? Yes, he absolutely is because you just need to look at the stats. If he wouldn't have DNF'd in Nürburgring, he would have had a 50% chance at least to win the race. And the same way he was in the lead in Mugello and a few other races that I don't even remember where he could have won. So the championship wouldn't, would have been a little bit tighter, but it is what it is. This is motor racing. Lewis lost the championship in 2016 also because he had an engine failure in Malaysia. So this is how the sport goes sometimes. And how do you feel Valtteri was on the Sunday night of Nürburgring? Does he know now that that might be the moment when it slipped away? Valtteri wasn't happy. I saw him after the race and I saw him on the airport and you could clearly see that it was a moment where that hurt and hurt a lot. And I think if you're a racing driver with, with his ambition and the ambition is to become a world champion and you realize you've just got a big hit for this year's ambition that is difficult to swallow. But on the other side, he's been so resilient and he's, I'm sure he's going to continue to push these championships and then next year, there's another goal. You'll hear more from Toto right after this. Now, here's a little fact for you. Did you know that Toto Wolf can speak six languages? Yes, six. That's no mean feat, is it? In fact, it's an incredible skill to have under your belt, especially in the world of international business. 
And if developing your linguistic skills and learning a new language is something you've been wanting to get your teeth into, then Babbel can help. Babbel is designed to get you speaking a new language within weeks with daily 10 to 15 minute lessons. It's available as an app or online, so no matter where or when you log on to a lesson, your progress will be synced across all devices and can be completed on your own schedule. There are 14 languages to choose from, including Italian, French, German and Spanish. And I know Toto can speak all of those. And it's created by 100 language experts. Yes, real people. So you're not reliant on translation tools. And right now, Babbel is offering our listeners six months free with a purchase of a six-month subscription with the promo code GRID. So go to babbel.co.uk slash play and use the promo code GRID on your six-month subscription. That's Babbel, B-A-B-B-E-L dot co dot uk slash play promo code GRID. Why do you think the dynamic between your two guys works so well? They are totally different characters, but the most important is that they do the talking on the track. There's no political games between them. There's no hiding of data. The exchange that happens in the briefings is actually better than I've ever seen. They would share experiences out on track, set up information, and um, I've never seen any difficult moment between the two. And that is a very important factor because we are traveling circus. We go to these tracks 20 times a year. We spend a lot of time with each other. And if the two drivers fight, that creates a negative momentum, negative dynamic in the team. And none of that has ever happened since Valtteri joined the team. And on the track, like we've seen on Nürburgring, they race each other hard without ever colliding. And because they are so different, there is a competition on track, but not out of there. And how different is it to how it was before Valtteri joined when Nico Rosberg was in the team? We shouldn't be judgmental on, on characters. I like to speak to Nico today, and I think the things he does around sustainability are really great. Some things in the relationship between Nico and Lewis we will never understand because it goes back many years from go-karting into junior formulas and how it all grew from camaraderie to rivalry to animosity is something that we were spectators of. But the dynamic, the dynamics of what happened between them was very difficult to actually follow. And um, they just fell out pretty early on, actually, when I joined in 2013, and it got worse and worse and worse. How difficult was it to manage? It was very difficult because when you have so much negativity in the room, Was it that blatant? You'd be sat with the engineers and you could just feel the negativity. Yeah, there was a lot. Even though that you were dominating Formula One in 2014. It doesn't matter. There was a lot of negativity and that would drag the whole room down. And we came to a point where we said, that's just not feasible anymore. And we talked about it. But the animosity between the drivers was still there and much beyond the point that Nico retired. And that's why it's so refreshing that since the year Walter joined, we haven't had any of that. Because there will be some fans listening to this saying, Toto, why didn't you just throw in Max Verstappen alongside Lewis Hamilton? Give us all a different dynamic and a different narrative. Walter does a great job for us and Lewis does a great job for us. And they are still at the peak of their performance levels. Then we have juniors that are coming up that have been with us for many years and could be the future for us. So this is what we look at. And the the situation around Max doesn't provide any opportunity now. He's bound to Red Bull. I respect his loyalty a lot. I think it's important for, for Red Bull to have Max. There's a lot of narrative around that. And Red Bull was, you know, picked him up from from very very early on when he joined Toroso. So the situation is what it is and, and it's good for him and good for us. Is your success tinged with a little bit of regret that there hasn't been stronger opposition over the last six years? I think you need to stay humble. Of course, we enjoy, we try to enjoy the success we had and the success we hopefully have in the future and try to build an organization that is resilient to regulatory change and stays on top of the game. But what I realized on the Nürburgring again is that we love the competition. And when we see a Red Bull coming up and staying close to us, not quite sure whether we win the race, I enjoy a positive result much more than on a, on a weekend where we are left 
unchallenged. But then on the other side, be careful what you wish for. <laughs> yeah, because do you think in 2021, Red Bull might pose a serious threat because the cars are staying the same? Seems to me they've closed the gap over the course of this year and then they won't lose that momentum over the winter with the build of a new car. Do you think there'll be a proper threat next year? I think it's the law of diminishing returns. The longer regulations stay stable, the more teams will catch up because obviously the development curve of the leader of the pack is going to flatten out and the other ones over time will still have a steep development curve. But this seems to be uh, not understood within the decision makers who think that changing the, the rules every two or three years is the lottery that is linked with it is going to maybe change the packing order. So in a way, changing regulations for us every three years is actually the optimum. It's clear that with stable regulations next year, Red Bull is going to get closer. We're very much looking forward to that. This is very much our opinion from every single soul in our company. Bring it on. That's what we thrive on. We need the challenge. Lewis Hamilton wins the Eiffel Grand Prix and ties the all-time win record. Michael Schumacher has company sporting history made at the Nürburgring. What a drive, mate. In such difficult conditions. That was just awesome. And the Stappen just picked us for that fastest lap just by six one thousandths. Yeah, I see that. They're getting fast, man. We've got to keep pushing. What a result. Thanks so much. Your, I assume, mid-conversations with Lewis right now about his future. And of course, the last contract you did, you did it with Nicky. And now you're negotiating it on his own. Have I, have I read that situation correctly? I think we owe it to Nicky to even have Lewis in the team because he pushed very hard back in 2012 and Singapore was the was actually the event to lure Lewis away from McLaren into Mercedes and that was a bold move from both sides because Nicky had to you know open up his portemonnaie and Lewis had to take a decision that to go from a top team into a team with potential and a great brand but clearly not a front runner so he was uh, the key part back then and since then the last time around or the last two times around I was negotiating the contract spent 10 hours in Lewis's apartment followed by pizza and it was pretty um, pretty easy and straightforward. Lewis and I are completely aligned in what we do and we recognize that there is one day every three years where we have objectives that differ. But in a way we know that and it's uncomfortable for the both of us because negotiating with a friend is always difficult. But we get our heads around it and at the end we've always come out with a compromise, you know, the best deal is when both parties feel that it's not great and this is what, how we felt every single time. So that's okay. Now, Andrew Shovelin, your chief trackside engineer, was saying at the weekend how Lewis has evolved and improved as a driver in the eight years that he's been at Mercedes. How do you feel he's evolved and changed, both in and out of the cockpit? I think talking about Andrew Shovelin, he's somebody that has, in the same way like Lewis, evolved tremendously from the first day I met him to today. He's not the, the person I met in 2013. He's not the Andrew Shovelin. He's not the Shov that we know today. And he's been a, a really important part also to get the best out of Lewis. And Lewis himself, what always inspires me is how analytical and how skeptical he is about his own level of performance. When you listen to his debriefs when he's won a race, Nürburgring is a good example. We spent 45 minutes on debriefing his race. He could have left quickly and gone, but there's so much hard work that is invisible to everybody else. And though some of those kids think, okay, this is what we're racing here and that's good fun. And then we, we dash off and Lewis does the contrary. And uh, the development of him out of the car is amazing. The trust he has given to the team over those years has evolved. And um, within the car, I don't think we need to even comment. Uh, he's clearly the the best guy of this generation. But how do you feel he's improved in the car? Because the engineers think he has. Do you think he has as well? I mean, I think the way the engineers and Lewis cooperate is, has changed a lot because obviously engineers tend to disregard the driver's opinion. They look at data and the driver very much feels uh, left aside with their comments. 
And I think what we were able over those last years to really align the perspectives of both sides and get the best out of the data and the best out of Lewis. And today we have a situation that they trust each other. And that is something that is very important. And we have situations where Lewis makes a call and the engineers say, that sounds right. And on the other side, the engineers make a call and Lewis will say, that sounds right. Can you describe what it's been like to ride the wave of success with Lewis? I think that the success we had with each other has built a great relationship of trust from a pure professional re uh, relationship and skepticism to each other. We have um, really grown together and uh, we are now capable of enjoying the good moments and we share those good moments. In the past, we would always speak to each other and text on the Sunday or Monday after bad race only because that's the way we are, we are wired, always leaving no stone unturned when something went bad. And now we are actually capable since a while to remind each other that is just a good moment that we had. And I like it a lot to have the exchange on Sunday night and Monday. Enjoy the journey. Enjoy the journey with all its ups and downs, where, according to his motto, we lose and win together. Now, Lewis says statistics don't matter to him, in spite of the fact he's just equaled Michael Schumacher's 91 wins. Does stats matter to you? Absolutely zero. Stats are something from the past. And apart from a few insiders and my mother, nobody's really interested on how many races I've won or championships. It's but you're a, about to break the record for the number of consecutive titles. Does that mean anything to you? No, it doesn't, because it's the past. I want to do a job and seek perfection in what I do and what we do every single day, and I only think about tomorrow. I can't tell you how I will feel about it when I leave the sport one day or when I'm older. I might be looking back and say, great, but I think those records don't matter. Who thinks about how many rings Phil Jackson has won? Who thinks about how many Super Bowls Tom Brady has won? Or how many Champions League wins Ronaldo or Klopp has done? It's completely it just interests the insider. And in, in that perspective, we need to think outside of our microcosmos. So where's the satisfaction for you? The satisfaction is about enjoying what I do every single day. It's the relationships with the people. It's building an organization that is resilient and an organization that is successful. And that translates into the stopwatch. I like to compete. Do mistakes and bad races keep you awake at night? They do, yes. They do keep me awake for a few days. And um, it's probably more pain in losing than joy in winning. But that keeps me on my toes. Lewis Hamilton is the only driver to have come into the pits. No one else has come in because the pit entry is closed. I believe we will get a penalty. Lewis Hamilton, two separate time penalties. What happened? Those starts going to the grid. Got a five second penalty for each. Where is that in the rule book? So Monza with the closed pit lane, Russia with Lewis's practice starts in the wrong place. How were you after those? I mean, we will have explanations why it happened and, and that's why you can get your head around it, but absolutely avoidable mistakes from everybody and something that we're not going to do more than once. We need to learn and be honest about it. And this is what strengths of the team that we never blame a person or a group, we only blame the problem. Why do you never go on the podium? Because I'm having so much visibility in the media anyway, that I like to have the podium for the unsung heroes. Everybody who contributes to the team's success in the same way I contribute, should be seen up there and should be recognized up there. I, I'm speaking to cameras every single day um, on the racetrack, so. But wouldn't you like to share the moment with Lewis or Valtteri or whoever's won the race? I went on the, pod on the podium in 2014 when Lewis won the championship because it was our first championship. And I felt that 
you know, that was something to be proud of. But I haven't been since then. But, you know, the last time at Nürburgring, the guy said to me, they're going to put me in chains and drag me up to a podium. <laughs> and, uh, well, there's nothing I could do against that. Let's see. I will try to hide when it's about winning a championship. Can I ask you about Racing Point now? There was a Ferrari earlier in the year about what was called the pink Mercedes. How worried did you get during that saga? I think the whole episode was not good for Formula One. And you kind of understand some of the teams that suddenly got beaten by a team that was running six to sevens in the Constructor Championship and suddenly is fighting for third. And that certainly creates questions. How is that possible? Can one really reverse engineer a car and then be performing on that level? And I accept that position. But on the other side, we know perfectly well that Racing Point has a great group of people, particularly in aerodynamics, a mindset within the team that is very strong. Um, in the past, they wouldn't have the funds to develop a good car and they were still able to compete for the odd podium. And when they were finally given the resource from Lawrence Stroll, they did very well. And I know as a fact that no part that was not allowed changed hands. They did it on their own in a wind tunnel and with the tools they have learned to deal with. And with, a, as I said, a great group of people that develop and execute on track. The guys around Andy Green and on track Tom McCulloch is just uh, the top of the game. Now, one guy who's joining them is Sebastian Vettel next year. You said you owed it to him not to rule him out of a drive with Mercedes straight away. Did you ever actually speak to Sebastian about a drive with Mercedes? Sebastian and, and I are friends. We, we know each other for quite some time, but we have never s spoken to each other on what happens on track. But when Ferrari to decide to end his contract, obviously the thought came up of would Sebastian be a driver for us? But I'm so loyal to Valtteri and Lewis that I first needed to see how our future would go. I would never have been able to commit to Sebastian before knowing that our two drivers would want to continue. And that's why there was actually never any conversation apart from socializing that went anywhere. And Sebastian very much respected that. And do you think he will relish being back in a smaller racing team next year? Do you think we'll see a more competitive Sebastian Vettel in 21 than we've seen in 20? I'm certain about that. A driver needs to feel well within an environment, needs to be supported and needs to be looked after. And I believe that changing teams will give him a fresh motivation. He hasn't forgotten about how to drive a car. He's a four times world champion. And uh, I think just the momentum went against him. And then obviously when, once you're in this downward spiral, that becomes very difficult to actually escape. And I think Aston Martin is a fantastic brand and I think he's going to thrive on it. Were you surprised that Honda are pulling out of Formula One? Very surprised and sad, actually, because Honda belongs in Formula One. They've been there for a long time as an engine supplier and as a team owner. Then them pulling out was not completely unexpected, but it certainly created some headlines that were not good for Formula One. Then the works team relationship that they had with Red Bull was something that was certainly good for Red Bull. And um, so they need to feel, uh, fill the void there of having lost an engine partner. And I think it all comes down to return on investment. Whatever you put into the sport, you need to get out of it. And if the numbers don't stack up, investment versus return, then I understand that an OEM would always look at it and question whether it's the right activity. And I think that the board in Japan came to the conclusion that it wasn't. They want to focus on electric vehicles. What do you think the future holds for Formula One? I think the future is bright because Formula One has shown to be resilient even in the COVID crisis. We were the first global sport that got going and we still do. I think the FIA and Liberty have done a great job around creating those bubbles, allowing us to race and providing a show for spectators in front of the television and on the social media. So heads off how they've done it. And going forward, sports, exclusive sport content like Formula One is growing. And uh, we see the numbers. Even on regular TV, we are growing audiences. 
not speaking about social media where it's, where it's exploding. And we are tapping new generations, kids and teenagers that become very interested. The Netflix series has equally helped a lot. And I believe that we can grow from strengths to strengths. And um, once we come out of this very difficult episode around Corona. Do you think Formula One needs to go electric? Though? I don't think that Formula One needs to go electric at that stage. Uh, Formula One needs to be sustainable, needs to embrace new technologies around sustainability. And today already we are the most efficient hybrid engine in the world. But we're not really good in selling that and talking about it. All teams and Formula One are trying to have the least negative carbon footprint that we can. And um, the future engine regulations need to certainly go towards more electric, more green fuels and um, more energy recovery through the devices that we have today or new ones. And maybe the, the energy recovery and battery energy that we have today is not going to be 15% of the total power output, but maybe in the next generation of power units, maybe 40 or 50%. And that would be a good step. What do you feel about the prospect of Andy Cowell going to work on a Red Bull engine. Andy's obviously leaving HPP. And I will always respect every man's and woman's decision about their own career. Andy very much left Mercedes because he felt he came to the end of the road of um, Formula One. He said that he's interested in you know doing something good for the planet and the technology around it. If his mind changes, Again, I would have all respect for it because everybody needs to seek happiness. So finally, Toto, you're not interested in statistics, I know, but looking further ahead, what is the long-term goal for you? How long are we going to see you in Formula One? Or are you going to go and do something completely different? When I asked Sebastian Vettel this question, he said, my long-term goal is happiness. What is it for Toto Wolff? Now you said it, but I would have given you the exact same answer. At the end, it all comes down to be happy because that means everybody's healthy. You're enjoying your time with the family and the people that are important to your friends and um, equally enjoying the relationships that you have on track. This is all encompassing. It's all about happiness. Who else would like to see Toto wrapped in chains and dragged onto the podium before the year's out? But what a great chat. Even though Toto's in the news a lot, he always delivers a few gold nuggets whenever you chat to him. What he said about the relationship between Lewis and Nico Rosberg, the animosity between them, was fascinating. And you can tell that he still feels Nicky Lauda's loss deeply. But I also loved getting his thoughts on the here and now, where he sees Formula One going in terms of power units, why he didn't seriously consider Sebastian Vettel for a Mercedes seat, and why Lewis continues to get better and better. Toto, many thanks for your time. It was great to catch up. Well, that's almost it for another week. But before we go, let's dive into the virtual mailbag to see what you've been saying about last week's show with Chase Carey. Adrian Nolan got in touch to say this. Instead of 1 plus 1 equals 1.5 and arguing over who lost the half, let's have 1.1 equals 3 and argue about how we're going to share the 1. That was a great summary of F1's divide and conquer past and Liberty's new approach. That quote was absolute gold. Well, I couldn't agree more, Adrian. That one quote tells you a lot about Chase's approach over these last four years. And David Miris got in touch to say this. Great episode. However, I'd have to respectfully disagree with Chase regarding the Netflix Drive to Survive fan base only interested in the teams and drivers. One episode focused on the behind the scenes at Liberty Media and the FIA would prove hugely popular. Well, it sure would, David. Let's hope it happens before the end of the year. And Jimmy Sakovich got in touch to say this. Great episode. Definitely enjoyed hearing Chase's side of the story in dealing with and running the sport through the pandemic. Wouldn't mind a round of golf with him either. Well, you're a brave man, Jimmy. I think Chase is going to get properly good at golf next year. I'd get the round in early. 
Sorry if I haven't been able to read out your message, but please rest assured that I look at everything that you send in. And remember, I'm at Tom Clarkson F1 on Twitter, or you can use the hashtag F1 Beyond the Grid. As ever, thanks for listening. Beyond the Grid is produced by F1 in association with Audioboom. Until next time, keep it flat out.